see. Record. There you go. in how water behaves differently when it's near an interface. Uh, and there are different things that happen. For example, within about a nanometer of the interface, you have kind of some distortion in the structure of the water and that kind of stuff. Uh, within about 10 meters of an interface, you have kind of long-range Coulomb charge screening interactions. Uh, and then out to longer distances, the presence of the interface kind of inhibits, the, well, decreases the importance of advection, and so diffusion and electron migration, things like that become more important. Uh, this is important in a range of areas like reactive transport, uh, kinetics of facial reactions, properties of nanopores membranes, uh, chemomechanical coupling and colloidal interactions, uh, multi-phase flow, unsaturated force media, uh, and uh, chemistry of aerosol water droplets in the atmosphere. So within this large sphere, what we mostly focus on is the way that water behaves on the surfaces of smectite clay minerals. So these are little mini natural nanoparticles. They have a thickness of about one nanometer. They, they form flakes with diameters on the order of maybe uh, a couple hundred nanometers. Uh, you get a pretty, a really high specific surface area here, about 800 meters squared per gram. Sorry, yes. Just so spectite. Why spectite? Is it the most abundant in nature? Uh, I'll get to that. Okay. So uh, high surface area, mostly on the basal surface, about 99 percent, and maybe one percent on the edge surface. Uh, they have some structural defects that give these, these, this crystalline structure a negative charge, and because of that, they have a high cation exchange capacity. So there's some, some ions here that have to kind of hang out near the surface to, to charge balance it, uh, and they're called exchangeable cations. And then because of their high aspect ratio, they tend to form stacks, but because of the hydration energy of these cations, the stacks have a hard time completely dehydrating, so you get some interesting kind of swelling mechanics. So each of these hexagonal planes that represents one of those layers. This is one of those layers. This is one of these layers. Yes, one nanometer thickness and a couple hundred nanometers. Uh, they're not exactly hexagonal if you look at them. Sure. But, um, but it's thought that the, based on the, what are the most favorable edge for crystallographic orientations, they should be hexagonal. Uh, it's thought that these charge defects in the structure here kind of make the edges proper. Uh, and so if you image them by cryo TEM, you get nice. Uh, stacks of layers of clay minerals. This is uh, a team image of a stack of smectite particles suspended in water. And so, let's see. Uh, it turns out that these, these clay minerals are the most abundant uh, mineral in terrestrial weathering environments uh, if you're in temperate regions. Uh, if you're in, semi in tropical regions or semi-tropical regions, you tend to get other minerals the predominant ones. But in temperate regions, like in most of the US, except near Florida, uh, this would be the main type of mineral in your soils. Um, and the main contributor both to the specific surface area of your soils and your cation exchange capacity. Uh, if you start getting like 30, 40% of the minerals in the soil, you get this kind of characteristic cracking behavior. Uh, but even without, with lower percentage of it, of it you, they're still going to strongly influence kind of like the chemistry because they contribute so much to the surface area. Uh, and then in sedimentary basins, they're also very important. Uh, it's estimated that in if you look at the total rock mass in a sedimentary basin, about half of that mass is coming from two types of clay minerals, smectite and illite. Uh, where smectite is this one over here that has the ability to swell and shrink. And illite is uh, essentially the same thing, but with potassium in the interlayers here. And because of the low hydration energy of potassium, you get a clay mineral that has the same kind of grain size but doesn't swell or shrink. Um, so we would expect that. These should be the, the predominant contribu contributor to the specific surface area in temperate soils and, and most sedimentary formations worldwide. So when you say it swells and shrinks, it's with water? Uh, yes. 
Yeah. So the basically you can have a very low hydration state in these. And you can cause them to swell or shrink either by changing the salinity of the fluid, by changing uh, by exposing them to air with different relative humidities, uh, by changing the type of exchangeable cation, uh, by compressing them. So one reason why we're interested in these clay minerals and sedimentary rocks is that they're important for low carbon energy. Uh, this is one IPCC scenario from 2005 about how you could potentially decrease uh, global CO2 emissions. Uh, it's the one that's relying the most on these fine grained rocks. It's the one that I'm showing. They're saying, well, we're on track for this. We could cut our CO2 emissions by relying on renewable energy and conservation and efficiency. Uh, but we might also rely on uh, techniques that use properties of these fine grained sedimentary rocks. Then, uh, for example, we might use more nuclear energy. Um, Pretty much all countries right now that have lots of nuclear energy and that have large sedimentary basins are considering um, fine-grained, clay-rich sedimentary rocks as potential host rocks. And in most of those countries, it's the main rock that they're considering, for potentially the exception of the US, or they're not sure. Uh, and in most cases, they're also considering a clay-rich engineered barrier right next to the waste canisters to kind of try to limit how much water flow is occurring in that region. Uh, the shift from coal to natural gas, at least in the U.S. and Canada, is driven mostly by fracking of the same types of rocks. Um, and CCS over here relies on capturing CO2 from a coal burning power plant, injecting it in a high permeability rock like a sandstone, and then relying on a low permeability cap rock to prevent it from escaping. And in most pilot sites that they've done, this is a clay-rich, fine-grained sedimentary rock uh, with high content of smectite and milling. Um, we're also interested in smectites because of their important for the for the Earth's carbon cycle. So uh, there's a lot of soil organic carbon. Uh, by some estimates, there's about 4,000 gigatons of carbon in soils. Most of it is organic. It's about five times more than what's in the atmosphere. It's pretty much higher than the atmosphere, the biosphere, and the surface ocean combined. Uh, there's a high spatial variability for reasons that aren't completely clear, and there are large fluxes. So plants are pumping in about six six times the anthropogenic CO2 emissions in terms of carbon into the soils, and then microbes are eating that and converting it back into CO2. Um, what people have found out in the last kind of five, ten-ish years is that this soil organic carbon actually consists predominantly of smallish organic molecules. So historically, they used to think that this was mostly kind of gigantic uh, macromolecules with extensive polymerization. Uh, but lately, with high resolution mass spec, they've been finding that at least half of this consists of molecules with masses of around maybe 500 deltons. So small molecules that should be pretty rapidly eaten by microbes, but that seem to persist for hundreds of years for some unknown reason. Um, so it's not really clear what, what, what controls the persistence of soil carbon, but people have been pointing out for a few decades that uh, some of it seems to be related to the presence of fine-grained minerals. Uh, there was some disagreement about which fine-grained minerals are important in the literature uh, until this study here that just came out a couple months ago where they did a meta-analysis of more than 5,000 soil profiles worldwide with uh, mineralogy and organic content at different depths. And what they find is that if you focus on soils in uh, temperate regions, which tend to have a soil pH higher than about six and a half, uh, it's mostly the cation exchange capacity and the smectite content that correlate with the soil organic content. Uh, these here are soils in more highly weathered regions, like uh, tropical soils or boreal rainforests. Uh, so for some reason, the amount of carbon in soils at equilibrium correlates the most strongly not with climate or anything like that, uh, but with the content, with the abundance of these smectite clay minerals. People don't really know why, uh, but that's one thing that we're hoping to figure out. Um, let's see. So within that, uh, we're kind of focusing on three major kinds of research. Um, the kind of bread and butter of what we do is look at the fundamental properties of water at interfaces and nanopores. And this is pretty much the same area uh, that I was working on before coming in, except we're working on different topics within that area. Uh, new stuff that we started uh, since I arrived is that we we're also looking a lot at, uh, at a larger scale at the hydrology and mechanics of soils and sedimentary rocks, uh, trying to get larger scale descriptions that are informed by what we're finding at the small scale. Uh, and we're also looking at mineral organic interactions, so looking at water and minerals, but also throwing in some organic matter in there. Um, of course, there's a lot of overlap between these topics. And within this, we're specifically focusing on kind of seven ish different questions. 
Uh, one of them is the thermodynamics of confined water. So when you squeeze water in a manifold, does it does it behave differently than more water? Uh, one of them is understanding kind of coupled fluxes in charged nanoporous media. So if you have a nanoporous, uh, a nanopore with charged walls, you tend to get preferential transport of water versus salt. Uh, but the current models that people use to describe that seem a little dicey. What do you mean coupled? Uh, you get what's um, that? Mostly the, the, the transport of the cations and the anions is coupled. And if you have a nanopore with charged walls, you're inhibiting the transport of your anions, which means that the cations have a, well, it's a negatively charged walls, like, like it would be mostly in the environment. Uh, that tends to slow down the transport of your anions because they don't want to be near the surface, uh, which means your cations also have a hard time flowing through because of some coupling between them, uh, which means you end up with kind of manopores media that let water through much more easily than they, they let salt through. Um, let's see, at the intersection between the fundamentals and the hydrology and mechanics, we're trying to improve the current models that people have been using for decades to describe colloidal interactions and chemomechanical coupling. Uh, in this area, we're trying to improve the models that people currently describe to, use to describe the permeability of soils and rocks. Um, in this area, we're trying to look at the influence of natural organic matter on the wetting properties of minerals. In this area, we're trying to work on essentially how organic matter and organic contaminants uh, stick to mineral surfaces. Uh, and in this area, we're getting into aerosol chemistry, which I'm not completely comfortable with, but there's interesting questions in here that overlap with, with mineral organic interactions and fundamental properties of water interface. Uh, let's see, my first year, I got a couple of postdocs here and a grad student. Um, my second year here, I got three more PhD students. Uh, <coughs> essentially in the CPE department. Uh, my third year, my two postdocs got faculty jobs, and I got two more postdocs and a, an MSc student. Uh, and then my fourth year, I got one more postdoc and three more grad students, including another CPE one. <coughs> Let's see. So we have different sources of support for each of these areas. Uh, the work in this area. For the, mostly for the last three years, it's been supported by a large uh, research center, uh, an Energy Frontiers Research Center, where I'm, it's a collaboration between about 20 different PIs. Uh, I'm one of the four people on the executive committee of the center, and I lead one of the three uh, thrust areas. Uh, that project just ended, and that's been replaced now by the uh, NSF Career Award. Uh, in this area, for the last three years, I've been supported by uh, the DOEBES Geosciences Program uh, is part of a large collaboration with eight PIs, uh, including Jill Banfield, Ben Gilbert, Carl and all that. Uh, that just ended at the end of last year, uh, but I got my own funding uh, from the same program. And then this here, so far, has been mostly supported by PEI and the Carbon Mitigation Initiative. Uh, I submitted a proposal in this area last fall. I got some pretty good uh, reviews from the NSF. I mean, Program manager. Uh, and then all of this, as, at least as far as the molecular modeling that we do, is supported by the DOE supercomputer. So they give us about uh, 30 million hours of CPU time every day. Um, so I'm going to show some highlights that mostly focus uh, on some stuff that I've done, and also show some stuff that Tom, Jenny, and Sydney are doing. Let's see, research highlight. Uh, so the motivation here is uh, uh, something I got curious about uh, four-ish years ago, which is trying to understand what controls the transport properties of fine-grained sedimentary rocks like shale. Um, so in 2015, I compiled a bunch of data on the properties of a whole bunch of different shale formations. Uh, the orange ones here are being used for fracking. The yellow ones were used as cap rocks for CCS sites. And the blue ones were being studied to store high-level radioactive waste. Um, and then if you look at the properties of these rocks here, there's interesting stuff that comes out, which I published in ESMT letters in uh, mid-2015. Uh, for example, if you plot the mineralogy of these different rock formations, they're all being called shales on a ternary diagram. For these are the clay minerals, the finest grain minerals. Uh, these are large grains of quartz and feldspar, and these are carbonates, which, yeah. Um, you find that all of the rocks that are being used either as cap rocks for CO2 sequestration or for storing radioactive waste have more than about one-third clay minerals. And all the ones that are being fracked to get hydrocarbons out of them have less than about 40%, uh, which is a bit puzzling. And also, it's not clear why these rocks are all being called shales if they're so uh, heterogeneous. 
Um, and you get the same. Yes. I have a question. Yeah. What controls the transport pump for these? Um, yeah. You focus on water or all fluids? Uh, in this case, I'm just loaded in water, mostly just water, uh, which is a bit annoying because for a lot of these gas shales, when they report permeability coefficients, they are only interested in gas permeability. And uh, the, there are some studies that show that you can't easily convert from one to the other for these kinds of problems. Um, so here, these are measurements of core scale for properties like the hydraulic permeability in the direction of normal depending uh, on these different rocks plotted as a function of their clay mineral mass fraction. This is the permeability of a very clean sandstone. And then you get a massive drop in permeability when you go up to about one third clay, and then it keeps decreasing a bit more slowly. Uh, this, it's not clear that there's a change in the slope, but there's some nicer data uh, with synthetic mixtures of sand and clay that show a much nicer break in the slope uh, right about one third clay. Uh, and this is the mechanical property for which I can find the most data here. Uh, it's how much, how much stress you can apply to these rocks before they break. Uh, and you can see that there's a 20-fold drop in the strength of the rocks at about one-third clay minerals. Uh, so the core scale measurements seem to be saying something that's consistent with the regional scale uses of these rock formations. Uh, so you're saying when you increase clay minerals, the rock becomes easier to crack. Uh, the rock becomes easier to crack, but it's also going to be, become more, these are going to be more brittle. You have to apply a huge stress to them to break them. Uh, these here are just going to basically deform and they're going to have, they're going to flow kind of. I see, I see. If you create a crack in them, that crack is going to self-seal pretty easily. So, uh, so it kind of, in a way, it makes sense that these would be used as seals and these for cracking. Um, so this is actually consistent with, a, uh, let's see, I, mentioned in this paper and in the follow-up paper, it's consistent with the conceptual model of the properties of sedimentary rocks that has been used by a couple of people in the past, where you basically very simplistically imagine that a fine-grained sedimentary rock could be viewed uh, uh, to the, the horrified geologists uh, as a collection of large grains of sand and you know, quartz, felflower, carbonates, uh, some large pores in white here between those grains, and then a fine microporous clay that fills some of the space between the grains. And if you do that, there should be a threshold here where all the large grains touch each other, and you have just the right amount of microporous clay to fill the gaps. And you can easily calculate with some assumptions that that should show up at about one third clay minerals. Um, so that seems nice. Uh, it kind of implies that, OK, you should get a really strong threshold in the mechanics, because here the contacts between the large grains are controlling the mechanics. And here this mushy clay matrix is controlling the mechanics. Um, also, it kind of implies that if we're interested in the sealing properties of the, of the rocks that have the high clay content, the ones that might be used for storing CO2 or radioactive waste, uh, we're really interested in this kind of this side of the diagram. Uh, and conveniently, this is a side where it should be relatively straightforward to get predictions of the properties of these rocks, because you should get a relatively easy upscaling from the Basically, the macro scale properties should be pretty directly influenced by what's going on at the micro scale within this microporous clay. Uh, so, what we're trying to do is try to predict that at the micro scale and see how it links to the, the larger scale properties. So, what we're trying to do is stuff like zooming into the microporous clay and looking at how the clay particles are stacked together and stuff like that. And then from that, trying to determine how that's going to influence the mechanics of the um, Yeah. So, People in the past have tried to do this kind of stuff, but it's kind of tricky. This is a, a drawing that somebody came up with. Uh, essentially, it's hard because this kind of microporous clay, there's no strong cements between the particles. Uh, essentially, the interactions of the between the particles are all mediated by water. Uh, and so you get microstructures that are really highly sensitive to what the water's doing. If you recover a rock and then you dry it up, you get a <coughs> microstructure. Uh, also, because the particles are just a nanometer thick, so it's actually hard to get techniques that give you the resolution that you want. So I, have a, I have a question for clarification. The geosciences community uses the word clay in two ways. Mm -hmm. They use it to talk about a set of minerals, the clay minerals, and they use it to talk about yeah. materials with a certain particle size. Are you switching between those two? Uh, no, here I'm just talking about clay minerals. Uh, okay. So here this is... Uh, so throughout, you're always talking about this clay minerals. This is all clay minerals by mass determined by X-ray diffraction. Um, OK. Although this kind of threshold over here, if you used the kind of soil science definition as a grain size fraction, you would kind of expect it to show up. Also, because the main controlling thing is the large size difference between the grains 
and this microporous matrix and these larger things. So uh, let's see, right. So there's not good data on the microstructure over here, but people have been trying to guess it based on X-ray diffraction data and also circumstantial evidence from uh, anion exclusion from the pore space and stuff. Uh, and what they find typically is that there's two types of pores in here. So there's stacks of parallel clay particles. Uh, if this is a swelling clay like smectite, there's these uh, nanopores between the clay particles with a thickness of less than 0.9 nanometers. Uh, and that, the interlayer spacing varies in steps of 0.3 nanometers, because that's the diameter of a water molecule. Uh, and then there's some larger pores over here that seem to only be wider than 3 nanometers. And then there's a pore width range between 0.9 and 3 nanometers that seems to be kind of not allowed. We don't really know why. Uh, these small pores, the nanopores, seem to be stabilized by short range interactions like steric effects and hydrogen bonding. And then the larger pores seem to be st uh, kind of stabilized by longer range interactions like the Coulomb repulsion between the charged particles. Um, and you see this showing up, for example, these are X-ray diffraction data uh, on a compacted sodium smectite uh, as you're increasing the compaction over here. And as these peaks are shifting to the right, that just means that the pore width is decreasing. Uh, and so you can see here you're squeezing your sample, there's a continuous decrease, and then you jump to like a stepwise decrease when you transition from one to the other swelling region. Uh, and you see the same thing if you take a suspension of clay particles and you analyze it by XRD, uh, but then you change the ionic strength. This is the inverse square root of the ionic strength that's being imposed by sodium chloride. And as you're going to a more and more dilute solution, you have first a stepwise swelling, and then you jump up to this osmotic swelling range and you have a continuous swelling range. Um, unfortunately, the models that we have to describe colloidal interactions do a pretty good job of describing this range over here where you have long range interaction. Um, but they are really bad at describing whatever is happening beyond that range when the particles get closer to each other. Uh, which happens to be the range that we're more interested in for, for sedimentary rocks. Um, and so a couple of years ago, uh, I came up with the idea that, well, maybe we could use molecular dynamic simulations to actually predict the microstructure of these media. So it's, it's hard to study them experimentally. Uh, and in principle, this should be feasible with the, with the resources, the computational resources that we have now. And just to illustrate this, this is just a kind of routine kind of simulation in molecular biology of the biological membrane channel. Here has more than a million atoms, and they can use it to study the transport properties. So we should be able to do the same kind of stuff for, for clay water mixtures. Uh, we should be able to take, make little simulation cells, put a few tens of mini clay particles in there, uh, add some water everywhere, uh, slowly remove the water and squeeze the system, and create microstructures that are kind of pretty good analogs of the ones in the real world, and then predict their transport properties. Uh, the only tricky thing here is that to run these kinds of simulations, we need good models of all the interatomic interactions. Right? So this is MD, it relies on semi-empirical interatomic potential models. Uh, and it's until about last year, we didn't have good models for these. Uh, so we've been, uh, the last few years, we've been trying to develop those models. Uh, this is one illustration of the kind of stuff that we're doing. Uh, this is with some collaborators at the, uh, the Argonne National Lab. Uh, they have a nice setup where they can take a, a mica crystal. Uh, a mi mica has the same structure as these smectites, but it comes in big crystals, so you can study them experimentally more easily. But you can place this mica crystal on the surface over here, flow solutions with different chemistries uh, on top of it, and then bounce some synchrotron X-rays off of the interface. And when you do that, you get a signal that tells you something about the electron density profile as a function of distance from the surface. Um, so I met up with these people. Uh, three, four years ago, and then we planned a, a combined set of experiments and simulations where we did MD simulations of Muscovite mica uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, well, submitting them remotely from here, uh, of aqueous solutions with different solidities on the surface of Muscovite mica. And then when we, from this, we can actually predict the spectra that these people should measure in their experiment. Uh, and we get a really nice agreement for all sorts of different types of aqueous chemistries on the surface. Actually as good as when they usually just kind of fit their their data with a bunch of guessing pieces and stuff. So did you change the model compared to previously? Or uh, did previous models fail to give you? This is the, um, this is the, uh, actually an old one. This is SPCE water, which has been around for like 20 years. Uh, for the clay, it's using clay FF, which has been around for about 10 years. 
Uh, it's just nobody had actually tried this comparison previously. Usually when we tested these sets of force fields for some other properties, like transport properties of water and ions and clay and layers, we also did a delicate agreement. Uh, they've been getting much better X-ray reflectivity data recently because um, they have like, much better detectors at the same time. So, um, so this is basically telling us that we think that the best available models that we have, especially this one here, do a really good job of predicting what's going on on the spatial surface of the plate, which is 99% of the surface. Uh, the problem is, uh, this model wasn't parameterized to describe the edges. So when, when people developed that model about 10 years ago, they said, well, these clay particles are large. They have mostly basal surface. In a simulation, we can model them as infinite particles just using the periodic boundary conditions. So we're not even going to generate parameters for describing these edges. And besides, we don't even know what the edges look like anyways. Uh, so what we've been doing here in these couple of papers is uh, using kind of the best available estimates of the crystal structure of the edges, basically cleaving the edges stoichiometrically and healing them by adding oxygens and hydrogens. Um, and then the model predicts a lot of the sites, but it doesn't predict, for example, what this oxygen, uh, doesn't predict the charge on this oxygen. This oxygen initially had one silicon and two aluminum neighbors in the structure, but it's not under coordinated because you cut the edge. Uh, this oxygen over here used to have two aluminums and one proton, but now it has one aluminum and two protons, so it's a bit over-coordinated. Um, and there's not good rules for how we should do that. There's also some of these uh, charge defects, these isomorphic substitutions that occur near the edges, so we actually have more edge sites to parameterize than that. Uh, what we did in these two papers is show that we could, um, we could actually develop some rules for calculating the charges of edge atoms that were consistent that are consistent with the original model over here. So they're consistent with all the other parameters. Uh, they're also consistent with uh, Linus Pauling's uh, bond balance theory for predicting the structures of, uh, of crystals from X-ray diffraction. Um, and what we come up with is basically whenever an oxygen is undercoordinated by about one bond balance, it becomes more negatively charged by about 0.5, which is consistent with these metal oxygen bonds being about 50% ionic and 50% covalent. Um, so that works out nicely. Now we have a model that we can. Uh, but we still have an issue here, which is that this OH2 group actually just floats away from the surface. Um, but we did some uh, ab initio MD simulations that actually show that there's very little shared electron density at the middle of this OAL bond. And also that frequently the OH2 group just detaches, anyways, even with the ab initio MD. So eventually we just kind of turned this into a water molecule and transferred the residual charge to the other right, <coughs> aluminum. And if we do that, now we have a model where we can uh, model flexible clay particles with cut edges completely surrounded by water and have it floating around. Um, and I should mention Laura Lammers uh, was a person that I, I probably co-advised her in her PhD, and she's now a, a, a junior faculty at UC Berkeley, and she was instrumental in, in getting this also to work. Uh, it's kind of a joint effort. Um, so now we should be able to do this kind of stuff. Can we leave that slide? So I didn't follow your logic from the yeah. previous slide, or, or when you were saying that 99% of the surface area is this basal surface area, so it's been, the 1% the has been ignored. And I, so therefore, what, like why, why go after, why is that 1% so important that you need uh, to understand? If we can't model cut edges, we can only model infinite particles. And if we can only model infinite particles that are going through the periodic boundaries of the box. Yeah, but if, there's, if it's them. such a small uh, amount of surface area. Yeah, well, when, when previous yeah. people have tried to just take the, the original force field and just cut the edges and simulate it like that without caring about what happens here, the particles just break apart. They, like in this city, so figure over here, everything's exploding. So you can't actually model these particles as fully flexible particles tumbling around in water unless you come up well, not with this force field, which we think is the best available one for modeling the basal surface, unless you figure out a way to tweak the parameters to model the flexible edges. So, so what we've seen there, I just see pixels of that. Uh, this is a little mini elite uh, particle. Uh, an actual elite particle would have 20 of these layers over here. This one has just four. And it would be about a micrometer in this direction instead of eight nanometers. And these are these potassium ions that are in the interlayers over here because they have a low hydration energy to swell and swell that's like that. Uh, so, so Ian, if you go two steps back, so you were talking about the four sizes, the 0.9 to 3, and, uh, and then you said you're going to try to do that with molecular dynamic simulations by putting some random distribution of, of, uh, of 
smectites, and then wetting it and then drying it. And so I, I'm not sure I understand the goal. So are you trying to predict how how this distribution of pore sizes comes about? We like or are you trying to impose that and then see what happens? Mm, we'd like to be able to generate realistic microstructures at the mole using molecular simulations, uh, both in order to make sure that those microstructures can, pay, can agree with what people think is the actual microstructure, and also because once we have the microstructure at the molecular scale, we can predict transport properties. So, um, so let me ask you this then. I mean, if, if you if you have this initial condition of smack bites, yep. uh, doesn't the final uh, picture yes. depends yes. a lot on the initial yeah, condition? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll get to this. Okay. Um, so now that we have this, we can model we can model little mini smack bite particles. Uh, this one here is 12 nanometers in diameter. Tom is a postdoc in the group who started about a year ago. Uh, we can randomly distribute some of these charge isomorphic substitutions to, to give us some negative charge. Uh, we can add some exchangeable sodium ions on the surface to balance the negative charge. Uh, and then we can place maybe 10 particles in a simulation cell and fill the rest of the cell with water and see what happens. Uh, so this is the kind of system that we get. These are 10 little mini smectite particles. They're all the correct thickness, but they should be 100 nanometers in diameter. Here, they're just 12. Uh, the, so this is the clay. The green is the exchangeable sodium ions that balance the charge. And then everything else is filled with water, except that I'm not showing the water. Um, let's see. It's periodically, there's periodic boundary conditions. And what we're doing here is we're slowly removing water and letting the system equilibrate at uh, one atmosphere of pressure in the vertical direction. Uh, as we do this, then the particles should be reorienting and stacking up and aggregating. Uh, of course, the initial structure that we have is completely arbitrary because we're randomly distributing the particles. Uh, and they're also large grounding particles, so we can't really run the simulation long enough to let them reach a nice equilibrium configuration. Uh, what we're hoping is that during the dehydration, they're going to adopt configurations that are kind of independent of where we placed them initially, and that are also kind of more uh, strongly influenced by the basically the interactions between the particles. Um, what am I going to mention here? Uh, yes, yeah, so at any point in time over here, we could just you know, predict, for example, the permeability tensor, the conductivity tensor, uh, the heat of dehydration, uh, some dielectric properties, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, here we're getting an artifact, because you can see that initially there were several particles that were vertically oriented, and they didn't really reorient enough because they were kind of stabilizing each other. So this one ends up interacting with its own periodic image. Uh, so we're now moving to a larger simulation cell where and basically better predicting the initial configurations to prevent this from happening. What is this? This is cool. But what does it represent in, in the um, Earth? Yeah, I mean, so, like when yeah. in, you, I think you said you're interested in these minerals in sedimentary rocks where those pressure fields are pretty yeah. static. So, yes. so in this case, this is more a mimic of what happens if you, you make a suspension of clay particles and you pipette a little drop of it and you deposit it on the surface and then you let the water evaporate. As that happens, the system's going to shrink in one direction. So this is more like at the land surface. So this would be more relevant to, I don't know, swelling and shrinking of clay and soils, for example, near the land surface. Uh, to some extent, it mimics what happens when a fine grain sediment gets deposited at the bottom of the ocean, and then the water is slowly expelled by having more sediment deposited on top of it. Uh, but in a way, maybe less so, but not 100% sure. Uh, so, so yes. I mean, this is kind of similar to a problem one would get if we try to simulate turbulent eddies on the periodic domain that's on the size of the eddy. So you're going to need a periodic domain that's multiple times the size of yes. this magnet. Yes. Is, it, is it doable computation? Uh, yeah, 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 I'll show some images. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the kind of stuff that we can, just to show you that we can calculate transport properties here, this is just uh, showing you, well, uh, we can model the transport of water, the diffusion of water in this little one-layer hydrate over here, or in this larger board. And if we average it over a large enough number of water molecules in these domains, we get different mean square displacements, where the slope is proportional to the diffusion coefficient. So in principle, we can we can see, OK, water diffuses more slowly in the nanopores, and we can see how that depends on the orientation of the particle. Uh, and then just another illustration. This is the same kind of thing. Uh, I'm not showing the cations here. I'm just showing the water molecules. But each water molecule is being tagged by how much it's going to diffuse for the next few tens of picoseconds. And so you can see that the bluer ones, essentially water molecules that are closer to the surface or kind of stuck in a little confined environment, end up moving less during the next few tens of picoseconds. And the ones that are kind of 
in the middle of a larger core have more likelihood of being more mobile. Um, this is also kind of neat because at some point here you see a bubble that forms at this point over here. And the reason for that is we're, we're slowly removing the water. The system has an imposed external stress of one atmosphere over here. Uh, but the framework of clay particles here is actually trying to support the structure. So the water actually ends up being stretched, and at some point cavitation occurs. Uh, which basically just tells us that at the end of the simulation, this system would be in equilibrium with humid air instead of with liquid water. Um, and then finally, right, to get, try to get rid of some of these <laughs> particles interacting with each other through, the, through periodic boundaries, uh, we've now been simulating larger systems and kind of trying to distribute better the particles in the beginning. And the kinds of microstructures that we get at the end are remarkably consistent with the kinds of cartoon views that people have been making up of what the microstructure should look like for the last uh, several decades. Uh, so we're kind of going in now and developing tools to, to predict certain transport properties for dynamics itself. Are you also going to like just calculate the cell size distribution from that? Uh, yes, we have some nice data on cell size distribution for that. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I didn't so you mentioned in one of the previous slides that there are uh, that the, the pore size cannot be the same. Yeah. Do you get it with your? Uh, your uh, can you explain with your simulation? Why mm, you strangely, we don't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we get we get the stepwise we get the certain stepwise stability of, uh, of pores with uh, one or two or three water moles, but we don't we're not predicting really this inaccessible range of pore size distributions. And what we think right now is that. Uh, well, I'll show you. Uh, so another thing that we're doing with this, this, this gives us, let's see, this gives us some microstructures, but it's not very convenient for getting things like the swelling mechanics. Uh, and the reason for this is that there's lots of water here everywhere. So we can't just kind of like deform the cell and measure the, the, the stresses and stuff like that, because in order to get swelling pressures, we'd have to do these kinds of simulations at constant water temperature potential. Um, so to try to determine swelling pressures uh, as a function of distance and chemistry, what we're doing is simulations with two little mini clay particles. Uh, this is Sydney, who's in uh, grad school. Uh, these are the exchangeable sodium ions. There's water everywhere in the system. Uh, if we just run the simulation, the system's going to equilibrate to the optimal distance between the particles. So instead, we're using this tool called metadynamics, which was developed about 10 years ago to study kind of protein folding. Uh, to force the system to explore a whole bunch of different interparticle distances. And from that, we can get the, the code to tell us the shape of the free energy landscape. Uh, and interestingly, so this is the free energy, the, the slope of this would be the, the swelling pressure. Uh, and interestingly, for example, for this sodium smectite in pure water, what we find is, okay, there's some, some big free energy barriers over here. Uh, the most stable swe swelling state would be the particles that are kind of infinitely far from each other, which is consistent with experimental data. Uh, but we don't see a kind of like barrier between these crystalline hydrates over here and the long range swelling. We just see a flat landscape. Um, now a flat landscape would also imply that you're not going to observe these in, a, in an experiment um, because there's no minimum over here. <laughs> but there's still no barrier. So in our other simulations where we're dehydrating the system pretty rapidly, maybe there's not enough of a penalty to be in this range to prevent those from just kind of forming temporarily. And we're also correctly predicting that when you crank up the salinity of the system, that kind of tilts that landscape. And so that favors the shorter range, so more kind of collapsed structures of people, what people see, them. again, in, uh, in experiments. Um, from this kind of project, what we're trying to do now is compare this with uh, theories that have been used for like multiple decades to describe covalent interactions, mostly this DLDO theory over here, that are entirely based on long range interactions. So they say, well, there's a there's a long-range Coulomb repulsion and a long-range Van der Waals attraction, so we should get a free energy landscape like this. And instead, what we get is a free energy landscape like this. Um, and so our hypothesis right now is, OK, this discrepancy here must be something that the mean field theories aren't accounting for, like specific ion-ion interactions in the electrical double layer. Uh, and from the molecular simulation trajectories, we should be able to go in and determine exactly what that is. Um, and then finally, the last thing that we're doing with it that I'm going to mention uh, is these kinds of simulations where we have two little mini smectite particles floating around again. again. This is a, these are calcium ions. Um, and then we add in a few molecules of organic contaminant, and we look at whether or not it's going to absorb on the surface. 
uh, again, if we run a classical, this is Jenny who's in doing her PhD here. Uh, if we run a, just a standard MD simulation, the organic contaminants just stick to the surface and never detach. Uh, so again, we're using this metadynamics technique to force the, the molecules to explore the entire landscape and then tell us what was the shape of the free energy, uh, the free energy landscape. So this is just a few hundreds of picoseconds of simulation, but this is showing over 200 nanoseconds how the, how the code is finding out the free energy minima. Essentially, the darker blue color is showing uh, free energy minima, and so it's finding out that there's actually, it's favorable for the molecule to be near the surfaces, especially here and here, compared to being in cold water. And from the free energy difference, which here is about 100 kilojoules per mole, we can calculate a, a KD uh, absorption coefficient. Can, can you, before you move on, say simulations? Can you give me an idea what, what you mean by simulations? What, what, what? What equations do you have? Uh, molecular dynamic simulations solving Newton's equations of motion uh, based on a set of semi empirical interatomic potential parameters that we tested, like in those comparisons with the synchrotronics that we did. So you just place the atoms, you give them some kind of initial distribution of velocities that's consistent with the temperature that you're trying to simulate, and then the code just kind of solves the equations of motion. Uh, and if you have accurate good quality models of all the interatomic interactions, you get good predictions. And if you have bad models, you get those. So what, when you said you, you have models, do you write those models? Uh, no, these are, we, we try to basically pick the best available models in the literature. Uh, like I mentioned, the one that we're using for the clay, this clay effect model was developed about 10 years ago. and It's been extensively tested for these kinds of systems. The one that we're using for the water was developed about 30 years ago. Uh, but it's still one of the best water models that agrees really nicely with on X-ray data and all that. The one that we're using for the organic molecules is one of the three predominant models of organic matter. It's extensively used to predict, for example, the, the docking of uh, new drugs to like whatever organic molecules. Uh, we don't know whether or not this combination of models, when we combine them together, is going to give accurate predictions. Um, but Jenny's been the a couple of these models. Are they, uh, they, they have the same form. Basically, it's all a kind of Coulomb interactions charged atoms and some kind of van der Waals interactions that are based on the same mathematical form. So Jenny's actually been uh, carrying out some absorption experiments for some of these organic compounds that agree really nicely with her, with her simulation prediction. Uh, just because otherwise there would be no way for us of knowing, even though this is a really good model of predicting the properties of the organics in water, and we're also using a really good model of predicting the properties of the clay in water, we wouldn't necessarily know that by combining together so we're trying to do our homework here. So let, let me just ask you a question. So if you put the particle in vacuum, yeah. does it randomly move following a Brownian motion? Um, if you put it in vacuum, the code assigns an initial distribution of velocities to all the atoms that's based on, uh, that's consistent with the temperature that you want to simulate. So, so but you also need an energy. So. You, uh, you need an energy that goes into the vibration. And yeah, the yeah, vibration. Yeah. If, you, if you put it in vacuum, if it has an initial velocity, it'll just keep infinitely moving. But there's nothing externally balancing against it. Uh, if you put it in water, it'll, it'll, water molecules will be balancing. So, so, so basically, these inter, uh, so, so all the diffusion is happening because of the intermolecular forces. Uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah you can, sometimes when people want to accelerate the simulation, they will use uh, simulations based on very similar principles, but you try to remove the solvent, and then at every time step, you add a random force to like, the solutes and a random viscous drag to try to model the kind of random motion. But at this point, we're not doing that. Okay. Um, let's see. So this is some of our uh, Jenny's predictions over here, showing okay predicted values of log KD for let's see, six different phthalates, three PAHs, and one perfluorinated uh, anionic contaminant. Uh, they seem to vary pretty nicely with the molecular weight. The heavier ones are absorbing more strongly. Uh, and there's a large range of KD values. So this is like a linear absorption coefficient for sticking to the plate. Uh, and the range of results that she's getting, actually, it, it, these error bars are a little large. We, we have newer data that are better than this. Uh, but the range of results that she's getting is consistent with previous people that have studied the absorption of other types of organic contaminants on, on these kinds of smectite clay particles. Um, and it's also consistent with the fact that if you, if you extract organic matter from mineral surfaces in soils, you get compounds with masses around 500 Daltons. But if you look at the soil organic matter that dissolved in the pore water, 
you tend to get more compounds with masses of like 50 or 100 Daltons. Uh, so it looks consistent with basically how soil organic matter is deciding whether or not it wants to stick to a mineral surface or not. Um, and uh, yes, we have supporting experimental data, I think, for five of these compounds. This, 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 uh, this one, and that one. That I agree with the simulation. Uh, and then finally, uh, just a few words about this. Let's see, uh, these are all the papers and books and stuff that I've written uh, in a while. Uh, my PhD was in 2004. Um, I spent five years as a postdoc uh, with Gary Spazito and Frank Richter in Berkeley and Chicago. Uh, I spent five years as a career track scientist at the Berkeley Lab, uh, mostly with a group that was me and on average one postdoc, because it's expensive to hire people at the Berkeley Lab. Uh, I've been here the last three years. If you don't count papers that were led by collaborators, our output's been about two papers per year. Uh, but then again, the grad students and postdocs in the group have only cumulatively resulted in one paper so far. So. Uh, let's see. I've had a lot of senior collaborators over the year. This is my PhD and postdoc advisor. Um, and then these are other people that I've either co-edited books or written papers with. Uh, and this is mostly a factor of the fact that I'm playing a leadership role on this large EMRC collaboration uh, and on this kind of medium-sized uh, collaboration at Berkeley, uh, which kind of makes me write papers with these people. It's kind of hard to lead a project without writing papers with your collaborators. Um, and then at the same time, in blue here, uh, this is me plus various people that I've mentored over the years, uh, including Laura Lammers, who used to be called Laura Nielsen, and who's an assistant professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, Amy Hoffman, who I co-advised her PhD postdoc. Uh, she got a couple faculty job offers and she's now at NASA. Uh, Laura Hamm, who was Trish Dobbs grad student. Uh, she spent six months as my postdoc and decided to leave academia. Um, Michael Holmbo, who was my postdoc for a year and is now a professor at Memo University. Uh, Lauren Beckingham, who was kind of half my postdoc for two years, who was also with Catherine before that. Uh, who's now an assistant professor at Auburn. Um, Ruth Tenneker, who is actually being paid by Jim Davis at Berkeley, but she's credited me multiple times for inspiring her to apply for faculty jobs, so I'll just accept that. Uh, Grishma, who was my postdoc here for about a year, who's now an assistant professor at UW-Madison. Um, Batista Dazas, who was my postdoc here for about a year and a half, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Poitiers. Uh, and my only comment here is I find it remarkable that each of these people, after writing just one paper with me, basically got a faculty job. Uh, but I think it's just basically a result of the fact that we tried to write a few papers and try to go in depth on each of the papers that we write. Uh, and then finally, classic uh, citation methods. Uh, let's see, in Scopus, excluding self-citations, my H index is 19. Um, we've been getting decent numbers of citations that are increasing nicely. Uh, if I extrapolate to the end of this year, it's gonna hit about 280. Uh, and what I mostly like about this is that this is 280 citations based on only 30 papers. Um, and for most of the people that I collaborate with or that I compete with, to reach this number of citations, they typically have to publish like two or three times as many papers. So again, it's a measure of like how we try to not write too much, uh, but try to write the most impactful stuff. And uh, I should thank these three people from my group whose work I showed, plus the rest of my group, plus these uh, funding agencies. Thank you. Questions for Ian. I, I'm going to start. I, I may have asked you this question before. You know, it's a question I've asked to Jenny, and that is that your work on mineral organic interactions, from from everything I, from my entire experience about environmental chemistry, is that if there's an organic molecule in water, it will ignore the minerals relative to the organic matter, which tends to be abundant in most soils. So why is it important to isolate those mineral surface interactions if they end up being yeah. not important, if there's any organic matter? Present? So that, I mean, that depends on the community that you listen to. Uh, if you listen to people who, whose work is entirely focused on PAHs and PCBs, like the early work by Karakoff and Chu and all that, uh, they found really nice correlations with organic content, uh, and they demonstrated pretty nicely that it's 
that explains pretty much almost everything. Uh, if you look at work by people that have looked at more polar continents, uh, also a lot of these initial papers were based on things that they were calling soils, but if you look at it, they're basically mixtures of sand and organic matter, like lake sediments and stuff like that, uh, with essentially no clay. Um, if you look at studies with polar contaminants, there's actually a lot of studies that show that you can uh, <laughs> You're capturing only part of the picture if you assume that the contaminants are absorbing only on the soil organic matter. Uh, if you look at the literature on PAHs these days, uh, pretty much everybody in that community agrees that soil minerals and soil organic matter are playing equally important roles for the absorption of those anionic contaminants, which is kind of counterintuitive because as anions, they should be repulsed from the places. Can you give me an example of who are Lead it. Who are the leaders now in that area in terms of doing experimental work to show this? Uh, so Allison McKay's been doing some nice work with that, uh, obviously. Um, there's, uh, yeah, Jamila you know, Aristide's been doing some nice work with that also. Uh, Cliff Johnston, uh, over the last several decades, has produced a lot of data showing that, uh, produced, produced a lot of data showing that uh, clay organic interactions are important, at least in, in yeah, the follow up. Wouldn't it be something a threshold that if the organic carbon content is below 0.05 percent, yeah. the minimal interactions are dominant? If it's higher than 0.1 percent, it's the organic carbon that dominates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's hard to say. To, that's what people usually find when they look at it. So, so the one one issue is that when all, a lot of the data that people, a lot of the current models that assume that interaction is only with organic content are based on correlations. So people say, I measure absorption on 100 different soils, and I see a correlation with soil organic content. But I don't see a correlation with clay content. Uh, one issue with that is that they're using the soil science definition of clay content as any particle that's smaller than 2 micrometers, uh, whereas we already know that some clay minerals have much higher affinity for organic contaminants than others. Uh, another issue with that is we know that the soil organic content correlates with the content of certain minerals and soils. Uh, so if you're finding a correlation with organic content, you know, you might be lumping in some interaction with minerals. You know. uh, and then uh, there's also plenty of direct evidence showing that through, in some cases you can show that there's a threshold depending on the clay to carbon ratio. Uh, but the position of that threshold depends on the type of contaminant that you're studying. So for something like a PAH, it looks like at any clay to organic content, it doesn't really matter. It's mostly interaction with organic matter that can describe everything. Uh, but for more polar contaminants, uh, you can't predict in advance where that threshold is going to be. Um, and then the, I don't know, the most, the most convincing thing to me is like, I don't see why organic contaminants, uh, let's see, if, 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 if fine grained minerals like smectites are clearly playing an important role in determining the content of organic carbon in soils, so there's clearly some kind of interaction between the soil organic matter and the clay that's controlling the carbon content of the soils, then I don't see why clay particles would not play any role in determining the absorption of organic contaminants. Like, why would smectites influence soil organic matter but not organic contaminants when they're both organic molecules? Uh, so there's plenty of kind of circumstantial evidence and also some direct evidence showing that, at least in some cases, the mineral organic interactions are important. Uh, and for understanding kind of like the amount of soil carbon in soils, the minerals seem to be playing but I think the answer to your question is the, re the reason that the smaller organic molecules uh, will inter will the clay minerals could not have such an effect because the smaller organic mo molecules can dissolve into those larger organic molecule assemblages, whereas that m mechanism doesn't exist for those molecules. So that comparison that you that reasoning doesn't hold. I don't, why, why would small organic molecules be able to dissolve into soil organic matter but not large organic molecules? I mean, there's, they, there's nothing left for them to dissolve into, you know. Um, you, I mean, I, there are plenty of people in, in the soil science community these days that have accumulated a large amount of evidence that organic contaminants interact with clay minerals. And I know that there's this EPA model from like 40 years ago. That says that I think it's much more recent than 40 years ago. I mean, 
it's not doesn't go back to Karakoff in the 1980s. It's you know people like Joe Pignatello and Walt Weber and all these people worked on this up at you know for decades. And pretty much all of the data on that is on a small kind of group of organic contaminants, and it tends to focus on a fraction of the soils, particularly the upper layer of the soils that are particularly organic rich, and ignore anything below 10 or 20 centimeters where there's Okay, so that's so, a threshold idea that uh, Peter was talking about. So I'm not saying that other people are wrong. I'm just saying, you know, if you look at a, a portion of the parameter space, it looks like organic soil, organic matter is playing a controlling role. Okay. Uh, one part of what we're planning to do with these simulations actually is add in some small proxies for soil organic matter uh, into these kinds of simulations. Uh, that will probably be the, maybe the third chapter of Jenny's thesis. Uh, in principle, in here, we can add in some proxies for organic matter. Uh, look at how they're co-thickly particles. We probably need a bit of a larger simulation. We can set it up so that the mass ratio of organic matter to clay is appropriate to what's found in soils. Uh, and then we can look at how that influences the absorption of the organic matter. That would be a good, good um, idea, I think. Ian, yeah, I had to... Well, <clears throat> actually, I need to run class so I can sneak in one question. You talked about the edge effects and how they're they maybe more charged and yeah. strained, and but it's only one percent of the surface area. Does that matter at all? I mean, I would think with certain mm. compounds that would yeah. create preferential. Or so I'm asking. My question is, do you see the? Does that matter, or is that really we can just ignore it because as long as we get rid of these deleterious effects of water mm. blowing off it. Yeah. For absorption, we were thinking of, that we would see effects, but we don't really see them. Uh, for the rheology of clay suspensions, people have observed large effects where if you measure the rheology of a clay suspension, you, in some cases, you can see the pH of a large effect on the rheology. And people have always hypothesized that that's because if the edges become positively charged by absorbing protons, they're going to become attracted to the basal surfaces. And so on. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a step further compared to what we're looking at right now. So, Ian, I have a question about the upscaling. So, so you want to do these simulations to upscale. So, to to do this, you're going to have to take a soil soil sample, analyze its content, get models for the intermolecular forces, run a molecular dynamic simulation to upscale. Isn't it easier to take that soil sample and measure its conductivity and Absor absorptivity and absorptivity for something in the lab, yeah. just because the large scale are going to be continuum models. So, so why, why this? What does this long path get to? So, there's a large amount of data on, for example, the absorption of organic contaminants on soils. Exactly. Uh, and they really <laughs> haven't resolved the questions. That, there's still large disagreements in the literature between the people who are doing kind of measurements at the scale of soil samples. Uh, so hopefully we can kind of have a new angle of attack that's going to bring something new to the. So you, okay. For example, on the on the soil carbon, there's like a ton of people that are going out in the field and studying how much carbon is present in different soils, or that are bringing soils into the lab and doing colony experiments. Uh, as far as I know, we're pretty much the only ones that are saying, hey, let's try to look at the mechanisms that might control the persistence of soil carbon. So you need to understand the mechanism to explain the the disparity and continuum macro scale observations? Um, I would put it more like if you're doing a measurement at the large scale, you are getting the full complexity of the system. Right? Okay. There's lots of different physics going on. Uh, and everything is coupled to each other. Uh, when you do studying it at the much smaller scale, that forces you to isolate, that allows you, but also forces you to isolate some process and say, I'm going to study this process by itself, you know. So, and then we can see, does that explain what people have? Which is both a blessing and a curse because sometimes it's not really clear what, what phenomenon we should be deciding to study. I'm just curious about, uh, early on you pointed to uh, CO2 injection and cap rocks yeah. as, a, as a motivation I think, towards doing. So what you learn from these kinds of simulations or other work that, that advances our understanding of this sort of mm -hmm. large scale CO2 yeah. uh, Well, I didn't show really actually any of the upscale stuff that we're doing here, but um, um, 
we're uh, stuff that relates more to CO2. Uh, so we're developing simulation methodologies to model permeability in sedimentary rocks at larger scale. Uh, we're developing a discrete element model uh, that's kind of like a regular discrete element model, but also the elements can kind of transfer water to each other. They can kind of suck water from each other. Uh, and what we're hoping with that is we can predict, for example, the formation of crack patterns in fine grade media, uh, which would be relevant to something like the resilience to leakage of the catalog. Um, we're developing CFD simulation methodologies um, that basically can also kind of, at a larger scale, predict the permeability of a rock that's treated as a mixture of large grains and microporous clay and all that. Uh, and we're modifying the, that to have multi phase flow in it. Um, so we're doing stuff that's relevant to kind of predicting some things like permeability and multi phase flow in rocks that potentially would be relevant to people who need to decide what constituted relations they're going to need to use to describe cap rocks in large scale. Middle, middle, middle light scale resolution are you talking about here? Um, right now we're thinking of going up to centimeters, but some of the stuff that we're doing, we're going to do some kind of X-ray CT validating experiments that would be on centimeter resolution. So it's still very tiny, but, uh, but we're hoping that the insights are More questions? Maybe. So, can, can you, you mentioned the logical effects and stuff, so can you simulate something like the consolidation of the failure? Uh, which is a kind of slow process under the mechanical function. So, the simulations that I showed over here, uh, this kind of stuff, uh, part of the answer is okay. Um, here we're, we're removing water, right? And then we're letting the system equilibrate at one atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So it drinks. Uh, I think what you're talking about would be doing the opposite of pressing the system. That's right. And yeah. then uh, if we had a simulation that was uh, where the water was at constant chemical potential, and where water, where every few time steps you try to insert or remove a water molecule based on a reservoir of constant chemical potential, then we should be able to see the shrinking of the system, where we dehydrate the system by applying a pressure. Uh, that's more tricky to do. Um, what we're trying to do here instead is use this to kind of parameterize, use this in the swelling pressure simulations to parameterize larger scale models like a DDN model. Uh, or even kind of uh, coarse grained MD models where each, where we remove the water, uh, we treat each of these particles as a bunch of maybe 100 different interaction sites. Uh, we keep the ions. And then we figure out from the all MD simulations what effective interaction potential we need to use to run the coarse grain simulation. And then, since the coarse grain simulation wouldn't actually have any water in it, then we could just speed the system and see what happens. Uh, yeah, in terms of rheology, we could do other stuff like shear the system. In terms of that. Okay, that's, uh, I think there are no more questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>